Hello, Bronwyn Lund here from Bronholm Tours. I film the 360 walking tours of um, the island of Bronholm for people who either can't get to the island or can't get around the island. And today I'm standing on Clestens uh, Ou, which is one of the um, two islands off the coast of Bronholm. And uh, it's a, a fortress island, so uh, I'm going to uh, take you around to a few of the buildings that are on the island today. I hope you enjoy the tour. It's windy today, so I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear my voice above the wind. I think I'll do most of the talking when I'm actually inside the buildings. But directly across from us is actually a fantastic view of the Little Tower, or Lillatorn on uh, the other island in this uh, Erthelmeen archipelago called, Clast uh, called Frederick's Ooth. So we'll cross over and uh, have a look at that tower after we've had a look at the church and uh, the uh, big tower, or the large tower. This is actually one of the island's many big buildings and uh, it's a great place with an absolutely fantastic view to come and have a picnic. In this tour I'm going to focus on uh, four of the major buildings on the island. I have actually done a walking tour of the entire island in winter, um, so check that out on, uh, on the Christians Ooh uh, playlist. Uh, so, um, and that also includes coming to and leaving the island as well. So uh, if you're interested in, the, in seeing what it's like to sail here from the island, but this particular tour is really about uh, focusing on uh, the buildings. I'm not sure how the camera will behave because uh, these doors are actually locked, but this is the uh, chapel of the island. And as you can see, it's a, uh, a very uh, simple and uh, clean lined uh, Lutheran church with the baptismal font up to the left and uh, the altar uh, in the middle of the church. Um, now we're just going to go out and uh, go into um, Stortorn, or the large tower of the island. And uh, both of the towers on each of the islands were built as cannon towers. But have been converted into uh, really excellent museums. So it uh, says here, welcome to the Big Tower, and uh, we'll go and have a look at the uh, exhibition on the history of the Big Tower uh, in a minute. But uh, in addition to the exhibition, there's also an excellent uh, photographic uh, exhibition um, that is on uh, on the second floor so we'll uh, walk through and, um, and have a look at that but I actually think the introduction to the uh, photographic exhibition is really uh, interesting and describes uh, the uh, Erthelmeen uh, archipelago of which Christian Zoo and Frederick Zoo are a part of uh, really well um, the Erthelmeen Archipelago is one of the most distinctive parts of the Kingdom of Denmark. It exudes remembrances of its past and its natural surroundings are exceptional. The islands have a long and exciting history. The Erthelmeen Archipelago was at one time or another a base for pirates, a military fortress and the scene of dramatic events of war. Later the islands became home to a fishing community and an artist's colony. This little world far out in the sea is a symphony of many faceted impressions. The islands are girded by mighty stone walls and the cannon guarded harbour of the old fort. In the strait between Claston's Oo and Folwood's Oo is flanked by characteristic yellow barracks and cobblestone streets of granite polished by use. Two massive round towers dominate the scene. The interiors of the islands are, however, far less warlike in feeling. 
Here are small clusters of stone huts with flat tarred gables. There are also a few hipped roofed farmhouses with flowering gardens, little well tended spots in shady forests and thickets, and frogs in the small ponds croak lustily among the water lilies and rushes. More rugged nature prevails in the eastern region of the fortress with rough cliffs, wind and crashing surf. This is a remote place, reverberating with the cries of gulls where, on quiet days, the barking of seals can be heard from the more distant rocks. The seasons bring tremendous variation as well. In summer, when heat radiates from the cliffs and the old fortification walls, it is possible to imagine oneself in southern Europe. The walls built of stone on stone, without mortar, in sharp, precise lines, call to mind Roman ramparts. Gnarled mulberry trees grow in the small cliff gardens and the scraping sound of grasshoppers rises from the parched grass while the sun is reflected in the blue sea, where pleasure boats and old wooden ships sail to and fro. In autumn, the islands change character radically and resemble most the North Atlantic. Flocks of maritime birds shriek in competition with the thundering of the ocean against the cliffs and the wind that pummels the stunted tenacious plants. Sea mist and fog condense in the moss and lichen on the surface of the stones and accentuate their yellow, grey and green colours against the reddish granite. The visual experience of Christian Zhu is thus quite variegated, with dramatic changes in the character of its natural surroundings and among its ancient buildings. Here are cannon batteries and towers from the 1600s that present a hazy picture of a strange and bloody century. Half timbered buildings with Piedzic inscriptions from the 1700s and a carefully tended Danish Golden Age view. All of this is surrounded by the sea and the sharp cliffs, the soft lichen of the bedrock, the calm in the shady interior of the islands, and the blooming wildflowers. For the uninitiated, the many impressions can appear to be contrastive. One may also get the impression that an interminable battle between civilization and untamed nature is being waged on the earth and islands. But there is no opposition here, rather a symbiosis. Christian Zoo is a product of the interaction between mankind, nature, and the eternal transforming for course of time. So I think that's a fantastic description of, uh, of the island that we're on. I want to go in and uh, have a look at the uh, exhibition and um, also just to uh, point out that the tower is actually two, um, two buildings. Uh, on the left um, here is actually a lighthouse and that was built in after um, the uh, island ceased to be a fortress and uh, it's built inside the tower, which is actually rather clever, using a tower that was already um, present on the island and putting a lighthouse in to warn the ships. So from 1684 to 1856, Christian Mutsu was a defence. Uh, fortress, and for more than a century and a half, the island of Christian Zoo was Denmark's redoubt towards the east. The famous architect Loris de Flora described the island in 1756, and in front of us is uh, what the fortress looked like at that time. And the reason why the fortress was built was basically because uh, Denmark was surrounded by um, the Swedes. And uh, the Swedish king had had more luck in war than the Danish king, and Denmark suddenly found itself surrounded by Swedes in the Baltic Sea. In response, Christian V built the fortress on the island of Christian's Ood. However, it was not an easy task. After two years, 146 had died from malnutrition and fatigue. The island was scarcely habitable, and when the ships arrived from the mainland, they brought soil with them. This helped create a breeding ground for life in easternmost Denmark. And the fortress was actually designed um, by a Norwegian, and uh, the Norwegian um, soldiers actually lived um, on a ship uh, called the Three Lions Ship. Uh, while the fortress was uh, being built. And on the bottom right hand yes. corner is actually a map that had been drawn up by Swedish spies who had watched the progress of the construction closely. 
So from 1720 to 1809, um, the, the fortress was designated as protect, protectress of the Baltic Sea. And although the fortress was a strong edifice, it was not properly maintained during the 80 years of peace that lasted from 1720 to 1801. Some of the batteries were even abolished. It was not rebuilt and reinforced until after the British bombardment in 1808. After this, gun yules and privateers, state-authorised pirates, found protection under Christian, Christian's use cannons. And the cannons behind the thick walls of the large tower were almost invincible. The commandant was originally supposed to live in the tower, but the islands actually turned it into a church instead. So the large tower that we're in now was built in 1684. The thick exterior walls are three metres thick and thick and can withstand both cannonballs and grenades. At the top there are 16 cannon ports where heavy cast iron cannons used to point out menacingly towards Denmark's enemies. The tower has hosted both a church and a bakery and in 1803 the lighthouse was built between the inner and outer walls of the large tower. By then the cannons had already been removed from the tower and in 1843 it also lost its roof. In 2017 the tower was renovated. I just wanted to go back to this point here about um, the Danish king in the bottom left hand corner because he was very proud of the construction um, of the fortress to the point of boastfulness and he had a medal struck which compared his own efforts with the feats of the Roman god Hercules and he called the fortress the protectress of the Baltic Sea. Actually, uh, one of the few remnants of what was left of the church. It's a memorial tablet, um, and the eye in the triangle has been a symbol of the Trinity and the all seeing God since the Baroque era. Um, this display talks about uh, the British attack, and uh, over to our right is actually a very, very clever depiction of the British attack using a, using a projector. And the British Danish wars hit Christians with full force in October 1808. Eight British battleships attempted to destroy the fortress by bombarding it from the seaward side. 300 bombs were fired at the islands, but the large tower held out. The British never made a decisive landing. Christian II's troops had been bolstered in the period leading up to the British attack, but the powder magazines were half empty and the cannons were too small. And Danes knew the devastating power of the British battleships only too well. The year before, Copenhagen had been bombarded when the British stole the Danish naval fleet. The large tower that we're standing in now was hit by cannonballs, but they rebounded off the thick walls. The commandant's home was destroyed, however, and six British soldiers were, soldiers were so badly hit that they were buried in only three coffins. The British ships kept a safe distance from the Danish cannons and battered the island for five long hours. However, the cannon's aim wasn't very accurate.
able to attack a fort, 1684-1856. Sea Fortress. A man who attacks stone forts with wooden ships is a fool, said Lord Nelson. A cannon on land was much more effective than a cannon at sea. It was hard to aim with a ship's cannon when the ship was rocking back and forth on the waves. On land, the cannons could be hidden behind thick stone walls, whereas ships at sea were sitting ducks. The coastal batteries were so superior that the large battleships gave up pursuing smaller vessels once they came into firing range from shore. And during the British-Danish wars, the harbour was full of privateers seeking the protection of the fortress. One of the privateer captains was the colourful Casper Wolfson, who had a chequered career, first as a smuggler, then as a customs inspector, and finally as a theatre director in Wanna. Wow, he did have a quite colourful work life. After the loss of their fleet the year before in Copenhagen, the Danes began a guerrilla war at sea with newly built gun yawls. The British were surprised at how effective the combination of lightweight rowing boats and cannons on land was. Chaos reigned on a warship in battle. The booms from the cannons mingled with the screams of the wounded, the stench of the gunpowder fouling with the sickly sweet smell of blood. The British attack was marked by accidents and unfortunate planning. The British Navy had previously attacked a stronghold with a martello similar to the large tower. It had not gone well and Lucan did not want to repeat of the fiasco, so he never commanded his troops to land on the island. He actually did not know that the um, large tower didn't at the time have any cannons in it. Here's just uh, inf information about uh, accessories for the cannon. And that's a cannon designed to be on the coast so you can move it around depending on where the ship is. Now this is uh, an interesting guy. He was uh, a bit of a buccaneer, I think. He, uh, he is called uh, Johann Hendrik August von Kohl and uh, he uh, is t entitled father to his crew. He lived from six, 1764 to 1820. He was born on Christian Sioux and travelled to the West Indies as a very young man. He was already an experienced sailor when he returned to the island at the age of 20 and rescued a British ship marooned on a reef. He was rewarded for his courage and skill with a position as officer on the island of his birth and later practically inherited the title of commandant from his late father. He is described as a father to his crew. And in his year, early youth, Cole sailed to the Danish West Indies as first officer. That may have been where he learned to do business. His salary as a commander on Christian Zoo is supplemented by income from rescue missions, either down and cattle. He was a very well-liked and compassionate commander. He convinced his superiors in Copenhagen to pay the fortress soldiers a higher salary. And if there wasn't enough, he opened his own coffer. He also invested in privateering, civilian ships, stocked hostile merchant ships and sold both the vessels and loads for large profits. And he was actually awarded the Primeritus Medal for his rescue missions. He was made a Knight of the Order of Danaport after being wounded during the bombardment of 1808. And this is just a little bit of information about the fortress closing down in 1856. The islanders had long been fishermen alongside their fortress jobs, so now fishing became their livelihood and the foundation of their lives. However, soon the first tourists began to arrive. So it very quickly went from um, a fortress and a place of defence to uh, being a tourist destination. Now we're just walking into the middle of the tower. We're going to go up the steps um, up to the second floor and um, just have a look at the photographic exhibition. Um, and, uh, and, uh, just check out the uh, pictures. This is, uh, once again, over to the left, we have the uh, lighthouse. And we'll go and have a look at the lighthouse once we've walked around. Uh, the tower because that's the exit out to uh, to the top of the tower
once again some fantastic views from the outside the windows here but we'll get a better view when we get up on top of the uh, lighthouse. The lighthouse is actually the natural, natural history museum of the uh, island. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the natural history museum but let me know in the comments if you'd like me to come back and and do a detailed tour of the Natural History Museum. Now it's very windy outside, so be prepared to be hit by a fair amount of wind as we go out and look out the top of the tower. So at this point we're looking along the south end of the island and the graveyard is down there to the right and uh, we'll walk all the way around. Down at the church, we can actually uh, see the house, which is so typical of all of the, uh, the churches we see in Denmark. The era. And a great view down in the harbour. over to the right is Bonhomme. You can see down into the uh, south to the harbour. We're back around it. Right, so we're going to leave the large tower now and uh, exit the building and leave Christian's view behind us. We'll walk the town through the type of town centre past the old pub and uh, cross over the bridge to uh, to Phoenix Zoo and uh, have a look at the uh, tower which is directly over from over the harbour from us right now. Uh, on the way to visiting the little tower or little tower as it's called in Danish, uh, we'll have a look at the uh, prison where uh, soldiers were kept and also a rather famous um, Danish political prisoner spent much of his life imprisoned there on the island. So we'll go and have a look at the prison first and then we'll wrap the tour up in, uh, in Little Tower. <laughs> so 
so this is uh, the old pub where the soldiers would come and drink beer. There's a kiosk and it's actually uh, open for lunch. Hotel and uh, the general store. Barracks directly in front of us, and I have actually filmed those barracks. Now we're leaving uh, Christians Island or Christians U and uh, crossing over to the other side of the island. You can actually see quite a lot of smokestacks and uh, Christians U is quite famous for its uh, smoked herring and apparently this is where the whole industry first started when uh, legend has it a Scottish soldier actually came across uh, and brought the technique of smoking the herring from Scotland to uh, to Clestons Oo, and uh, he apparently taught a girl called the Clestons Oo P um, how to uh, smoke the herring. Hey. Hi. And uh, that's how the legend came to to Clestion Zoo and then on to Port Hull with the smoked herring. And uh, the brand of smoked herring from Clestion Zoo is actually called Clestion Zoo Girl Herring. Clestion Zoo Pier Sin, it's called. So, and you can actually get it in Bornholm as well as on the on the island here. So. It is one of the little exports of the island. Now I just wanted to walk up and around um, to the prison before we come back and uh, look at uh, Lillaton and just uh, walk through some of these lovely barracks where the soldiers used to live with their families on the island and uh, each of these little houses actually only has two rooms so the families had two rooms and uh, they shared a communal kitchen with four other families. So it was pretty tight living space. And um, during the Wars, which is interest played a major role, uh, there was actually 187 families living on the island. And now this is not a big island, so, uh, it would have been pretty crowded and pretty difficult living conditions I think. So up ahead of us here um, is the was the island's prison. Uh, it has actually been uh, converted into down the path here over on our right is a uh, memorial to uh, to the political prisoner who um, who spent so many years of his life on JJ let's go and have a look 
Welcome to the state prison at Frederick Zoo. The prison was built in 1825 and originally had eight cells. On the west, north and east side of the prison was surrounded by a prison yard with walls of oak trees that had iron pikes on top. After the prison was closed and up to the beginning of the 20th century, the building was used as a warehouse for coal. After that, it has been used to store fishing tools and as a summer residence for visiting artists. In 1997, the prison underwent a complete renovation. It now contains Dr Damp's cell, five double rooms, a bath, toilet and a kitchen. Today, the cells are used by people who work on Clestons Oo and by visitors. The inn also uses the cells for bigger arrangements. Originally, the Fortress Christian Zoo was built as a base for Danish warships and privateers, but from 1725 it was also used as an exile for convicts. The island was used as a prison island until the 24th of May 1841, when the state prisoner Dr Jacob Jacobson Damper was released as the last prisoner of the island. Dr Damper spent 15 years of his imprisonment of altogether 20 years and 6 months from 1821 to 1841 in this building on Frederick Zoo. He was locked up in cell number eight, which can be seen at the first floor. So let's just go up the stairs and have a look at cell number eight and learn a little bit about Dr. Jacob Damp. So Christian Zoo actually has something in common with Australia. <laughs> it was used as a convict island. Slightly smaller than Australia, of course. So this is where he lived in the cell. And I'll just lean out into the middle of the room a bit more so you can actually see the lovely little fireplace that's over to the left. So it helps, I think, to have a little bit of a background history of Denmark in the beginning of the 19th century. The political conditions in Denmark in the beginning of the 19th century had roots back to the 17th century. Kongerloen, or the law of the king, dating from 1665 was, compared to other European constitutions, the most extensive and consistent example of absolute monarchy. The king, Frederick VI, in the photo there to the left, had, at least in theory, unlimited power and rights. So in 1799, Frederick VI proclaimed a declaration outlining and limiting the freedom of the press. The declaration stressed the continuing freedom of press in Denmark, but in reality it contained a set of rules on what could be written and the penalty if the boundaries were exceeded. It became illegal to criticise the government, and it was the breaking of this law that Jakob Damper was convicted of on the 14th of February 1821. Because of the Napoleonic Wars, Frederick VI in 1810 decided to intensify the censorship. Foreign relations were extraordinarily sensitive and the Danish government wanted to avoid conflicts as a result of critical articles in Danish newspapers. The papers now had to apply for permission to write about foreign political issues and the government could call back the permission if they felt that it had been misused. Four years later, the conditions of the censorship were intensified once again. It was decided that the chief constable of the police had to read through almost all printed material and he could confiscate them if he found that they were incompatible with the decrees of 1799 or 1810. From then on, advanced censorship was introduced in practice and the restrictions to the freedom of the press were not abandoned until 1848. So Jakob Damper was born in 1790 as the son of a tailor. At the age of 19, he graduated in theology at the University of Copenhagen. Apart from his activities as a public lecturer and an author, Damper was also a member of the Society of the Iron Ring. The Society worked for the making of a free constitution. To control the whereabouts of these potential criminals, the chief, chief constable of the police organised a Bureau of Investigation. Among the prime suspects was Jakob Damper. In the summer of 1820, Damper suffered huge economic difficulties. He had been divorced from his wife in 1819 and was obliged to pay towards the maintenance of his children. Now his former, life lived with his, former wife lived with his father. 
and he was suspended from Clio's. He couldn't pay the membership fee and lived by a small economic con contributions from his friends, many of which were informers who reported of his whereabouts to the police. In November 1820, Damper started preparing a plan and an invitation for a society which would work for a new public constitution. He was supported in the idea by one of his friends, a former captain of the army, Carl F. L. Topp. Unfortunately, Topp was a police informer and everything Damper wrote became known to the chief constable. When Damper needed some rooms for the first meeting to take place, Topp offered to pay for the rent. At the very first meeting, Damper was arrested with several incriminating documents. He was charged with having committed high treason and he was sentenced to death. But later the sentence was changed to prison for life in the fortress of um, Questions U. And then it just goes on to talk about how he was here and he was allowed to read the papers but they had been censored by the Commandant. Um, and he had, was allowed to walk around the island, but at bayonet point um, by one of the uh, soldiers. He did uh, try to escape a couple of times, but um, it never worked out. Um, they just uh, didn't get their timing right and didn't get to the meeting point on time. Um, and uh, then he was finally released um, on the 22nd of November in 1860, seven at the age of 77 so he spent most of his life in in prison 20 20 years and six months in prison so a third of his life in prison and um he was released actually by the next king he had to wait for the new king christian the eighth to release him because frederick the sixth wasn't going to let him go anywhere so this that was the most notorious prisoner um, on the island and uh, now we're actually just going to go over and uh, walk to um, the tower, the little tower, and uh, have a look at the excellent uh, museum in there. Oops. And um, wrap up the tour.
They also walk around this tour in the winter walk, around the tower in the winter walk. So this is the ground floor and uh, this tower actually has uh, four floors. Uh, so we'll go up and uh, have a look at the other floors. The most interesting being the uh, cannon firing floor. But uh, the ground floor of the little tower was used as a magazine and as quarters for the island soldiers. So soldiers actually lived in this part of the uh, tower. Just gonna have a little look here because it's theorised that this was actually used as a prison. So the powder magazine was in the cellar and it was well protected by thick walls. It might also have been used as a prison. And the reason why it needed to have thick walls is because the powder was very dangerous and flammable um, and couldn't be kept near the cannons. And uh, this is actually a money chest in front of us here and see it has three different locks. So you had to have three different keys to actually open that money chest. There's also an exhibition over here about uh, fishing on the island and uh, the fishing boats. And uh, if we go through into this room, which would have been quarters for the soldiers, there's uh, a history about the fishing um, culture on the island. And uh, this is one of the fishing boats, motors, the fishing boat was called the Orion. So let's go up to the uh, second floor and have a look at the place where they actually fired the cannons from. And personally, I think this is the most interesting floor of the tower. So the garrison lived in cramped quarters, whether in the Little Tower, Big Tower or the island's barracks. In the latter, each family had two rooms, the biggest of which measured three by three and a half metres. Their rations were not intended for their families and the soldiers supplemented their diet with vegetables from their small gardens on the island and fish from the Baltic. A soldier's family shared a kitchen with three other families. In 1807, during the Napoleonic Wars, there were 487 men on the island. They came from a range of units, artillery men and sailors, plus soldiers from the Marine Regiment and the Bornholm Militia. And there's actually a depiction of the different uniforms uh, of the militia and then uh, finally a sailor on the right. And this is a, a depiction of uh, a battle scene during... Uh, the uh, war with the British. So the battle scene depicts the cannon firing. The soldier with a feather in his hat is from the Bonhomme militia. He's standing with a type of sponge intended to extinguish any embers left from the last firing. The man in blue is a sailor. He's sighting the cannon using a trowel and the boy is carrying a tub of powder from the magazine in the cellar. Keeping powder by the cannons was too dangerous. And there's some information here about the different types of ammunition because it wasn't just cannonballs that could uh, be fired uh, from the cannons. There were all sorts of other horrible things that could be thrown at people. Um, and this chair over here is the sentry's chair. And there were sentries around the fortress day and night. No doubt they spent many uneventful nights in chairs like this. Perhaps they took a quick 40 winks in it. Even though the chair is no longer in use, Danish Defence keeps an eye on questions U. The Ministry of Defence owns the island, which does not come in the, under, under any local authority, but is governed by the administrator. The British bombarded Question Zoo in 1808, after which it was clearly apparent that the defences needed improving. The work was performed by conscripted soldiers and was so hard and monotonous that mutiny was always in the air. On the morning of 4th of August 1809, a mutiny did start. Cannons with burning fuses were dragged up Gillen, the street where the mutineers were looting food and brandy in a frenzy of drunkenness and plunder. 
They then stole a couple of ships and sailed to Sweden, where they were enrolled in the Swedish army. After the war, seven of the mutineers tried to return to Copenhagen. However, they were recognised and all of them were hanged. We'll just go up to the top floors of the tower and end the tour at the top of the tower. And this was actually the quartermaster's depot up here. And this was where the soldiers were issued with their uniforms and uh, their firearms. I love the extendable bed here on the left. And on the top floor here, we just have a model of how the island would have looked uh, in 1850. So that was a tour of uh, the four major buildings on the island, islands of Klestensu and Frederiksu, or the uh, Erthelmeen uh, archipelago in the Baltic Sea. This is Bronwyn Lund from Bronholm Tours, signing off. Bye for now. <laughs>